some flyers just fly. But these cheerleaders say Celia Huda lifted her teammates. Literally. She's probably like this tall, like, you know, tiny little girl. And she's like, no, I got you. Look. And she started to pick me up. It's like, okay, running down the beach with me. For these University of Florida competitive cheerleaders, memories bring smiles. But reality brings tears. Just a quick warning. The video will tell some gruesome details about murder victims and crimes committed by a very disturbed individual. This is not a topic that can be treaded lightly. And as such... Viewer discretion is advised. This is another true crime. Hello, my lovelies. It's Lady Curious, back with another true crime. This case really got to me because it really wasn't well known. There wasn't as much media coverage. When I was researching, I did not find a lot of information on the case. No detailed background. I did try to find everything that I could. And remember that this is for educational and documentary purposes. A University of Florida cheerleader goes missing and is eventually found burned and dumped on the side of a country road. Just please make this make sense. This case is about Salia Huda, also known as Sally. I will address her by Sally, since that is what her friends and family called her. She was born in Ghana on May 27, 1989. She moved to the U.S. as a young child. She was living the life of a typical 21-year-old, hanging out with friends, had a new boyfriend, and enjoying her last year of college and keeping up with hobbies such as cheerleading and dancing. Sally loved to dance almost through her whole life. When she moved to the U.S., she was on cheerleading squads to almost every school that she went to. She loved her family and friends. Sally's father described her as bright, beautiful, and a great student. At this time, she was attending the University of Florida in Gainesville. She was a cheerleader on the university's competitive team, and she also danced on the dance team called Urban Essence. She was a senior majoring in family, youth, and community service. She also graduated from P.K. Yonji Developmental Research School and Santa Fe College and she was a cheerleader at both. This happened on December 30th, 2010. A mother and her daughter were driving on a wooded area of County Road 225. They saw an orange glow fill the sky and called the fire department to report a possible brush fire. When the fire department arrived, they put out the fire, but then they discovered a charred human body. The forensics and police were called to the scene. The body was of a young woman. 90% of her body had been burned, and it was apparent that it was not on accident. They could smell gasoline, so they knew that it was a homicide. The police knew it would take them a while to identify the body. The other evidence found at the scene was a paper napkin and part of a cell phone case. And that was it. That was all that was around. After many hours, the police were able to identify the body, and it was Ocelia. The way that they could tell that it was her was one of her hands were as charred as bad as the other, so they were able to take her prints. This was when the police contacted Sally's father, who was, you know, obviously heartbroken at this point. He told them that he had seen Sally on the day that she died. He said he could not get into contact with her after she had left their house that day. The police went over to Sally's apartment, but there was no forced entry or any sign of struggle. A security guard told them also that Sally's car wasn't in the parking lot, so it was missing. The apartment complex had a key passcode system, 
and it showed that Sally left her apartment in the early evening of December 30th. The police canvassed the area, hoping to get more information from the neighbors. One neighbor did say that Sally and her ex-boyfriend constantly argued and that the boyfriend was often the one yelling. When news started to spread, a man named Mike called into the police, identifying himself as Sally's new current boyfriend. He told the police that he had been with Sally on Tuesday and Wednesday, and that she stopped responding to him on December 30th, after she left to run errands. Mike told the police that he and Sally had only been dating for a month or so, and that he was not the aggressive man that neighbors had heard in her apartment. He told the police that the only thing that he knew about her ex-boyfriend was his initials of A.D. Now, this is when they did track down this mysterious A.D. He actually made himself known when he appeared at Sally's apartment wanting to help. His name was Antonio Devin Drayton, a 20-year-old male. Antonio was described as a ladies' man who loved the club scene. He said he had met Sally two years before, but was also dating many women at the time, including his current girlfriend, 42-year-old mother, named Cassandra Kimbrough. The police were able to determine that Antonio was the loud, aggressive man that was often at Sally's apartment. In June of the same year, the police were called after one of these fights. Antonio had broken in and robbed and beat Sally. He even tried to choke her. But as love makes us blind, a little later down the line, she refused to press charges. And the case was eventually dropped. Antonio's excuse was he was drunk when all this happened. Sally's friends said they even thought that Sally had ended things with Antonio for good. But without them knowing, Sally and Antonio still spent some time together off and on, and they still continued their regular fights. Antonio told the police that Sally had ignored him for a while, but for some reason on December 30th, she had texted him asking where he was. He told her that he was at home. But then he said she never showed up. Using this information from friends and family and medical records, investigators said they were able to tie several of Sally's injuries to Drayton and cited two specific incidents. Her cousin said that what's done in the dark is now coming to light. And you reap what you sow. Antonio then said he spent the night with Cassandra watching movies December 30th when Sally never showed up. During the investigation, the police discovered that a woman named Angela had gotten into an argument with Sally just four days before she was found dead. And now Angela started dating Antonio. She was one of the many women. But supposedly she didn't know about Sally. And that was a reason for their falling out. Angela was brought in for questioning. She told the police that she filed a restraining order against Sally for an earlier incident. And Sally was arrested for violating the restraining order, which is why her fingerprints were in the system that identified her remains. The incident between the women that occurred four days before Sally died actually wasn't a confrontation but just a conversation. Angela said it was a heart-to-heart -heart convo, and she was actually really surprised by it. They so-called buried the hatchet, if you want to say. Angela had met Antonio in the club scene and knew about Cassandra. However, Angela said she had no idea that Antonio and Cassandra were actually in a relationship. Angela said that he made it seem like Cassandra just helped him out, and... Angela was able to give the police an alibi, but she did give them one more strange detail. She overheard Antonio talking to Cassandra on the phone. He asked for bleach, gloves, and rags. The police were convinced at this point that Antonio was involved in Sally's murder. His name just kept coming up. 
but now they just needed more evidence. After days of searching, Sally's car was found in an apartment complex parking lot. The apartment complex was within walking distance of Antonio's home. Sally's purse and wallet were in the front seat. There were no fingerprints found in the car, but there was an overwhelming smell of gasoline. The backseat floorboard was saturated with it. The police searched every gas station in the area between where Sally's car was found and the location of the crime scene. They eventually found the gas station that had the CCTV evidence in Stark, Florida the town where Antonio's foster family lived. Sally's car can be seen in the video pulling up into the parking lot. A woman gets out and goes inside to pay for $2 worth of gas and a gas can. The woman was eventually identified as Cassandra. Antonio's brother Pedro identified her as a woman driving Sally's car. Antonio's foster family said that he had arrived at their home unannounced on December 30th, asking for the money and a gas can. This is when Cassandra was brought in for questioning. She stuck to the same story as Antonio, that they were just at home watching movies all night. The police obtained Antonio's cell phone records, and it put him right at the crime scene, just 10 minutes before the mother and daughter made that 911 call. The DNA on the napkin was eventually tested, and it matched Antonio's DNA. The police thought that Antonio either wiped his hands or wiped sweat off his forehead and dropped the paper napkin on the ground, and this sealed his fate. The warrants for Drayton and Kimbrough were released Thursday by the county clerk of courts. The medical examiner provided their opinion that her death was the result of homicidal violence of undetermined type. That same day, Antonio was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, grand theft, abuse of a dead human body, tampering with physical evidence, and willful burning of lands. And Cassandra was arrested as his accomplice. They were being held Thursday in the county jail. Drayton on a more than one million bond, and Kimbrough on a $565,000 bond. State Attorney Bill Servone said Thursday morning that he has not made a decision on whether to seek the death penalty in this case. That the decision has not been made and will not be made for some time, he said. Antonio's story was he told police that Cassandra had killed Sally, by choking her with a belt. He told the police that he had only helped cover up the crime. As you can tell, my sarcastic voice he is a nasty monster. He watched Cassandra pour gasoline on Sally and set her on fire. The police knew it was bullshit and turned to Cassandra. Cassandra said Sally had gone to Antonio's to break up with him once and for all. This enraged Antonio. He was the type of guy that he felt like if I couldn't have her, no one can. So that's when Antonio strangled her to death and he called Cassandra for help. They both then drove around deciding what to do. And that's when they decided to just dump Sally's body on the side of the road and set her on fire in an attempt to conceal the evidence. This girl was only 21 years old, a bright light that was taken way too soon. Antonio and Cassandra both received plea deals. Cassandra was given a plea deal in exchange for her testimony against Antonio. And y'all will not believe how much sentencing she got. This girl, or piece of crap if you want to call her that, only got two years in prison and was released on October 14th 2012. And at age 26 by now, Antonio agreed to plea guilty to second degree murder and was sentenced to 45 years in prison. So I'm guessing that means they took the death penalty off the table. Wish they hadn't because, you know, Florida still does the death penalty. 
He is scheduled to be released in 2053. He will be 64 years old. Brewer reportedly is not sure of the motive for the crime, but said Drayton was possibly jealous because Huda had a new boyfriend. We believe Antonio was the only person involved in the murder. Brewer said it was hard to discern what Drayton's motive was for killing his ex-girlfriend. He consistently lied to investigators. I think he was looking for a place to put the body and perhaps help, Brewer said. In June, Cassandra Michelle Kimbrough, 43, pleaded guilty by helping Drayton dispose of and burn Huda's body and agreed to testify against him. Kimbra was charged with first-degree murder accessory and both were finally finalized and charged with grand theft, abuse of corpse, tampering with physical evidence, and willful burning of lands. Brewer said Huda's parents were in the courtroom on Thursday. A few days after her death, a Sun reporter reached Drayton by phone after he was identified as a potential suspect. Drayton told the reporter he had been drunk at the time of the incident that June and might have pushed her but never choked her. They had dated for more than a year but remained friends after they broke up. Drayton said he called the news of her death devastating. He was charged with killing her 20 days later. That gives me goosebumps and chills that he thought he was going to get away with it. He's an idiot. Sally's cousin, Danielle, said the few weeks since Sally's death had been a stressful time for family members, but they were happy that arrests had been made. She was really fed up with him and trying to get rid of him. Sally's cousin would tell her, that he just would not go away. I do believe that anyone that hears this will know there is right and there is wrong and there is good and there is evil. One of Sally's friends told investigators that Drayton was very controlling and tried to keep tabs on Sally's every move even after Sally got a new boyfriend and was trying to move on with her life. She said that he knew that Sally was trying to get rid of him and I don't think he was having none of that, she said. She emphasized that the family wanted people to remember Sally's joyful spirit and her involvement in the community. We're still trying to hold on to who she really was. She had a hand in so much good, she said. These are my final thoughts. I know I did not get to deep dive as much as I wanted to into this case, but when I started reading about this case, I really wanted to get her name out there and so people could hear her voice. I used to be a cheerleader, and once you're a cheerleader, it's like family. You know, all the girls on your team, you're very close, like family, and you end up having bonds for the rest of your life. And to be a cheerleader, she had to have been the most joyful, happiest person, and want to get the crowd up off their feet and get into some spirit and especially cheer on the the boys or men that are playing giving them the motivation to be their best as they're playing their game there's not much on the internet of this case and, and it upsets me the police did an excellent job of finding out who she was and finding her killers and they did not stop it just makes me sick to think that a woman that has kids would help a stupid man, you know, no offense to not stupid men, willingly dump and burn another person's body for that said man or that relationship. I mean, we need to be better. We need to find better partners. And it really pisses me off that she only got two years in prison. I've never heard of that. Like, I mean, I just... That blows my mind. It just, it's disgusting. She got off way too easy. And Sally deserves so much better than a low life like Antonio, who thought that his narcissistic ass could just take what he wanted. And that was the end of it. If you ever feel that you are in an abusive relationship, that someone is trying to take your joy away or control you or cut you off from friends and family and gaslight you, it's more easily said than done because it's like this repeating cycle that keeps going on and on and on and they do you wrong and then drag you back in. 
and do you wrong and then drag you back in and you keep thinking you can fix them you can fix them it'll be better next time it won't be they do not change at all down below i will have the number to the national domestic violence phone number they even have a texting so if you're too shy to call they can give you a lot of different resources in your area to get you help to protect you from these monsters. It's better to always call them and not just report it to the police because it's not taken as serious because the police can't really do much unless they were there, they saw it, there's proof, there's evidence, and you have to be willing to press charges. Unfortunately, um, Sally tried to get away from this monster and she lost her life because of him. I just feel like Sally didn't get the justice she deserved and I hope Antonio rots in jail and gets his karma in prison. I want to give my condolences to her family. I'm very sorry that all of you lost such a sweet soul. Please pray for the everlasting healing that this family needs. This is the end of this video and of this case. If I do for some reason find any other information that I feel that's very important, I will tag it in the comments below. I love y'all so much. I will have another case to y'all sooner than I did this one. I am very sorry that it took me more than a month to get this to you. Please like and subscribe to my channel. And remember, you are loved. And please stay safe. Until next time. Today. Alachua County detectives are hoping a car can provide the clues they need to solve the mysterious death of a UF student. Investigators are combing through 21-year-old Celia Huda's car. Deputies found the 2001 Nissan Sentra in southwest Alachua County yesterday, although they're not sure if that's where she left it. As GTN C in New Yorker reports, family and friends say answers can't come quickly enough. People are still in shock. Mm -hmm. People are still, you know, and pain and yeah. and it's just like the sorrow that has you know come upon us is just we never expected this never expected anything like this to happen this is this is just horrible what has happened even in the midst of the pain of losing a family member Danielle and Elam can't resist smiles when remembering their cousin Celia you know she was but this big <laughs> but just had you know the so personality and the spirit of a giant yeah. The 21-year-old student was born in Ghana and hails from a large West African family. Her death is felt many miles away. She spent many times fellowshipping with her cousins who are close in age. They all share a love of food and dance. I danced with her um, with African Student Union and because she was so little, we, she was, we always threw up in the air. Yeah. Always. It's like, okay, we need to go up in the air. She's yeah. like, okay, I'm ready. And because yeah. she did cheerleading, because she did <laughs> gymnastics, um, she ran track. She's, yeah. The pint-sized Huda had a big heart. In her free time, she coached cheerleading at Fort Clark Middle School, as well as participating in cheerleading and dance at Santa Fe in UF. She also volunteered at the village, a local nursing home. Her and cousin Elram plan to pursue nursing in graduate school. I don't have anybody to talk to about nursing anymore, so it's like, I don't know, it's hard. The family is devastated and wants answers into Celia's death. It's it's tragic. It's it's tragic and it's hurtful and it's disrespectful the way that, you know, this has happened. Just... Nobody deserves this, not not anybody at all, you know? They're hoping anyone with information will come forward. She was loved. She was so loved and oh, she's so cared about and you know, I just wish she was here right now to, you know, to see how people are really, you know, coming together and just, man. See a New Yorker, GTN News, working for you. If you know anything about the car or about Huda's death, you can call the Alachua County Sheriff's Office at 955-1818. If you'd rather not give your name, you can make an anonymous call to Crime Stoppers at 372-STOP. That number again, 372-7867, and you could get a $1,000 reward. 
On Thursday, 21-year-old Thalia Huda's burnt body was discovered in a brush fire near the Gainesville Raceway. The detectives continue to interview people. They are uh, forging ahead 24-7. On Monday night, Huda's missing car was found at an apartment complex in southwest Gainesville. Our forensics unit and team have been going all over that car today and uh, trying to see if there's any uh, evidence that they can come up with in it. With an autopsy report still in the hands of the medical examiner, sheriff's deputies continue to call Huda's death suspicious, a mystery to those who knew her best. She would never have been somewhere that she shouldn't have been. Before going on to UF, Huda left her mark at Santa Fe College, cheering for the Saints. You know, this smile, I keep going back to her smile, and and um, it's what drew me to her in the in the first place at tryouts when she first tried out. Um, and then, of course, she did a toe touch, and we all just fell out of our seats. And last November, Huda made U.S. competitive team. Like, who is this girl? Like, she's just this powerhouse of a, you know, girl you threw up in the air, she was tight, she knew what she was doing. A small girl, but according to her friends, a fighter. It, it just killed me because I know... Whatever happened, she wouldn't have went easily. So it was somebody that, had, that was very strong or something. And now her friends say it's Huda's memory that will lift their spirits. I just, I hear her laugh. It's, it's weird. Like, she just had one of those distinct, you know, you couldn't help it being happy around her. Friends say they received mixed signals about Celia Huda's former boyfriend, Antonio Drayton. I saw him out a few times. He seemed like the type of person that likes to have fun. You know, he lived his life to the fullest. To live her life to the fullest. Who would have ever thought that those two people who live life to the fullest would have ended up this way? Celia's teammates from UF's Urban Essence Dance Squad were close and knew something of her relationship with the man that they call Tony. Since her death, he left numerous emails, Facebook postings, and text messages for her friends trying to convince them that he had nothing to do with her death. Drayton went so far as to post a picture of a red splattered door on his Facebook page, implying that people were throwing blood on his door. Everyone was talking about it, um, the red door, and everyone was trying to figure out, you know, like, why is this going on? Um, some people hadn't even found out that the body discovered was Celia. They say that Celia was probably the only one who saw the warning sign. Detective Denise Scott, who works on the Intimate Violence Enhanced Services team, says that her office receives three to five cases a day dealing with what could potentially be domestic violence. She says that it's not just the physical signs that you have to look for. We always try to educate women, especially younger girls who are in the dating relationships and who are dating bad guys. Um, so we, we always try to give them uh, guidance, assistance, education, and ways to protect them and just kind of get them thinking different about who's good for them and who's not so good for them. It's a learning experience and it's a lesson to be learned for many females that if it's getting bad, just leave, you know, your life is more important, you know, I mean, love should not hurt. Celia's friends hope that other young women will take note and be more careful about who they surround themselves with. See a New Yorker, GTN News. Police say they you. have strong evidence against Antonio Drayton and Cassandra Kimborough in the brutal murder of 21-year-old University of Florida student Celia Huda. Forensics evidence that was collected to uh, reports from outside experts to uh, uh, phone records. Uh, they've all played a very key part in bringing this case to a successful conclusion. The two spent more than three hours being questioned by police before being taken to Alachua County Jail. Police say the couple killed Huda and burned her body. Her car was later found abandoned near the scene. Uh, we, we believe that the car was driven there by our two suspects that we have in custody currently. Video surveillance caught the two buying gas at a nearby location. And police say they also asked friends for bleach on the night of her death. There's uh, some indications that, that there was possibly some domestic violence there. Drayton has a long criminal record with charges ranging from domestic battery, assault, and disorderly conduct. Drayton and Huda dated but were not in a relationship at the time of her death. But police say they were in contact with each other. Huda also knew Drayton's current girlfriend, Cassandra Kimborough, who police say was an accessory to the murder. We may not ever know what the motive is. In every killing that happens, we don't always have a motive. They do not yet know the official cause of death, 
Both suspects are set to appear in court tomorrow morning. Venice Toussaint, Today, today justice News, has been served. Today justice has been served, and I know that she is not only proud, I know that she is happy. I know that, you know, she's happy that her family can be at rest. Salia Huda's family and friends have been waiting for this moment. Since her death, they've spent countless hours online searching for any information in the news. Word of an arrest was a relief. Tell me what went through your mind. I was elated. I was in the computer lab and everyone was looking at me because I was just screaming. I was, I was, it touched me so deeply. I was happy as not enough of words. The cousins and friends say they were almost discouraged because the investigation has taken so long. I've been searching for justice. I've been searching for peace. And, you know, I, I did. I changed my name on Facebook to Justice because I felt it was really important that justice be served. And I'm just, I'm so happy, like my best friend Brittany just said, happy is not even the word. It's not even a strong enough word mm -hmm. to describe my emotions at this time. I'm so proud. I'm just... I'm just so I'm just so happy and beyond. Now they say their family can rest a little better knowing someone is finally behind bars. We feel like she's a little piece of her still here with us. Mm -hmm. So we do what we got to do to keep holding on to the little piece that we do have. That's right. Stopped asking for forgiveness Cause you should know Only fools tread with the angels Fear to go But you keep trying to get too close Save myself by turning into stone